Hi, welcome back. Have you ever sat down in a restaurant, hungry, ready to eat, and when you open the menu, seen so many choices that you just don't know where to start? Sometimes you can have too many options. Data science is moving faster than ever, but its evolution is presenting a wide range of machine learning tools that are increasingly complex to manage. Fortunately, we have with us Antonio Rodriguez, an AI ML specialist solutions architect with Amazon Web Services to help us make sense of it all. Antonio, hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm fine, good to thank see you. you. Antonio, you have the honor of being our final speaker at the garage. The last thing between me and the final keynote, that's nice, thank you. Yes. Go ahead, Antonio, whenever you can, share your screen. We're ready, Something we can I'm see sure it. Now. You are, yeah, okay. so everything's all set. Thank you. So first of all, thank you for having me. Um, when I was preparing this session, to be honest, I was thinking what could be useful to share with the community in a talk like this? Uh, and I think that the main thing that we can share is our experience. And uh, the lessons learned that we get, uh, especially during the last year uh, in machine learning, because this is evolving really fast. So uh, one of those areas, the main pain points uh, that we see is industrializing the machine learning workloads uh, in the cloud, right? So um, first of all, before we start talking about the technology, because we all love to talk about the technology, um, we have to think, step back a little bit and think, why do we need this anyway, right? So um, the first thing is, what is industrializing ML workloads, right? So to us, industrializing is basically going efficiently from development or experiments in machine learning to production, right? So that's that's uh, what we uh, refer to industrialize. And obviously when we say efficiently, we want to do this in a way that is reproducible, that is uh, fully automated, uh, et cetera. The challenge is that the AI and ML industry is moving faster than ever. You know it, right? So we have a, a graph here uh, showing the amount of papers that have been submitted uh, per day. We have around 100 new papers, uh, and, and that's a stats from, from last year, actually. So uh, probably we are exponentially growing uh, from that number up. So there is a huge amount of tools. There is a huge ecosystem. Um, don't try to read uh, this slide uh, because there is no point in that. But the, the thing is, there are many options to cho choose from, uh, not only in open source, but also in the cloud and from third party. And often we feel like this, right? We feel like the imposter syndrome in us is uh, uh, increasing heavily uh, with all this amount of technology that we have at our hands. So for us, it is very important when we try to help our customers to decide the right architectures to um, understand that it can get really complex and it can take a lot of time so uh, we have to try to keep it simple and we have to try to uh, stop reinventing the wheel so uh, that is going to be our mantra during this session uh, when we talk about moving ml workloads to production and uh, obviously for doing that we want to increase the, that efficiency as much as possible and reduce the time to market as much as possible um, and how do we get there well we basically get there with the cloud so the cloud uh, already has a, a broad amount of tools uh, for helping you on that and with automation. So we definitely want to automate as much as possible. So that's uh, bring us to a concept that is called MLOps. And uh, what is MLOps? Well, it, uh, those of you who have been under a rock and doesn't hear uh, about uh, MLOps yet, um, if you know DevOps, which is the combination of development and operations, right? So moving in that continuous cycle from the development, experimentation, package, release, configuration, feedback, um, MLOps is simply adding a third wheel to this. So basically playing with data, experimenting in your machine learning workloads, uh, training models, evaluating those models, and then pushing those to the DevOps uh, wheels, okay? So that's pretty much the summary of, of what is MLOps. And uh, there is a nice uh, graph here from Cloud Guru that says that if we keep uh, in this thread, we are going to end up having three setups, right? Because we have uh, DevOps, SecOps, uh, MLOps, and, and all of these things. But uh, the point is that at the end, we should follow at least a set of best practices that we understand for MLOps. And uh, in Amazon, we like to say that uh, we have best practices until you find better ones because everybody understands the technology and the world and the MLOps in general in different ways. And that's fair. I mean, if you have your own view on how your company should address the MLOps, um, then you should follow that. But I will tell you the ones that we know, 
the ones that we have seen in our customers, as I said, this uh, last year, especially uh, with the evolution of uh, machine learning to more on, into an um, MLOps uh, uh, way. And the first, the first thing is that uh, you want to be agile in the experimentation. So an, another mantra that we have in AWS is we fail fast and we iterate often. So uh, we are not afraid of, of failing, but we have to do it fast. So you don't want to spend three months on a project uh, where you have a full team of data scientists working on a project and then find out that uh, you are going nowhere, right? So you want to fail really fast and then iterate, iterate until you succeed. So that's the idea. The other thing is that we want to avoid a few design anti-patterns. So I will talk to you about a few of them. And we want to follow the recommended principles. And those are very similar to principles in the cloud in general, but I will give, give you the ML flavor that we have of that. And eventually we want to automate, automate, automate as much as possible. So infrastructure as code, nothing in the console, nothing in the graphical UI, unless it is a test, a demo, an MVP, or probably presenting something to the CTO or the CEO of the company, right? But uh, at the end, you want to everything have it automated. So the first design anti-pattern that we have seen is what we call the superhero dependence. And, and, and that's pretty much when you have one data scientist or a couple data scientists who are owners of the full project end-to-end. -end. So they start a POC, they experiment, they understand all the um, things that you have in your project, and then they push this to production. What happens is this guy will become the most important guy of your company. And that's not a bad thing. The bad thing is when this guy is going to move responsibilities to another team, is taking broader responsibility or leaving the company. And then what happens? Then we have a, a big mess in production, right? So you want to avoid that. You want to decouple um, as much as possible the responsibilities within your teams uh, with regards to the steps of the machine learning pipeline. The other thing is the deep embedded failure. So we normally um, have projects that are complex, that require artifacts in machine learning, that require code, that require scripts, that require a lot of experimentation and parameters. You don't want to hard code anything. You don't want to have dependencies anywhere. So you want to be as much as not as, not this, as possible. And, and one example of that is that we have customers that start working with TensorFlow or with PyTorch, and then they change their mind at the end. And they say, well, maybe I just want to work with, I don't know, uh, TensorFlow from Python, MXNet, or something like that. So you want to be flexible on the frameworks. You want to be flexible on the parameters. You want everything to be uh, based on variables and based on repositories for that. The other anti-pattern that we see is uh, when you don't have a life cycle management for your machine learning models in production. So you make a project, it's a success, you push it to production, and then you forget, right? Wrong. So any model, any model, I would say, that you have in real life is going to eventually decrease the accuracy that you have uh, on that model in production. And that's natural, just because people is changing the behavior, because we have more data, because things are moving. So it's normal that the accuracy is going to decrease. So you must have a method for monitoring the accuracy in production and also for automating when you manage the drift. So the drift change that you have in general, okay? So um, in general, machine learning code, and, and, and I think most of the cloud vendors uh, are showing this slide uh, many words because it's really good. It actually shows you what is machine learning code within the full end-to-end -end workflow of pushing a project with machine learning to production. And it's really a small piece because uh, in reality, when you're starting a project and you're in the phase of experimenting and you are in the phase of research, then the machine learning code is very important because you're asking yourself the question, can I use machine learning to solve this problem? Is that the right approach? Because maybe an Excel spreadsheet can cover, right? Uh, but is machine learning the right approach? Should I use deep learning or classical machine learning and these kind of things? What happens when you push to operations? So you finally have an experiment that is working. You are happy with the algorithm. You are happy with the metrics that you're getting. And now you have to push that to operations. Then the machine learning code is irrelevant because that's close. You should have that code fixed in a repository and then focus on the rest of the elements in the workflow, right? How to uh, verify the data, collect the data, extract features, how to manage the resources that I have. If, if I have to instantiate resources in the cloud, how to do that, how to analyze. How, how, what about the infrastructure? Should I use GPUs or CPUs? Should I monitor this in production? Am I monitoring performance and I'm monitoring latency, drift, and this kind of thing. So it's very important that we focus on those other areas in the second phase. 
obviously, in all this story, there are a lot of teams that are participating, right? So there's not only the data scientists or the data analysts, right? So we also have people from security, in example, for making sure that we are complying uh, with, with all the regulations that we need. We also have DevOps engineers, very important, so that they make sure that we are following the best practices of CI/CD of our company. Um, we also have system uh, engineers uh, for helping us with the infrastructure that we need for deploying the resources. And obviously we have business sponsors, otherwise nobody pays for that, right? So uh, we need everybody participating and, and this is a collaboration and normally a transformation that you have to make in your companies if you are a, a manager and you have to decide the structure that your teams must have. So I have seen many customers this year that are moving, shifting towards transversal teams, collaborating with each other, and um, also moving towards having something like a cloud center of excellence or um, data scientist uh, center of excellence for machine learning and things like that. Um, so at the end, um, any project that you do with machine learning and with MLOps nowadays should follow a set of principles. And those principles are basically consistency because you don't want to uh, make environments variable. So if you test something and it works in my laptop, right? So that's the classical. Uh, we want to push it to production and make sure that it's consistent, that it's still working in the same way. Um, flexibility, we wanted to make sure that we can accommodate any framework or any parameters, any algorithms, as I said before. Reproducibility is very important. So I need to be able to recreate past experiments that I have done and also reusability. So I did a forecasting project or fraud detection project or classifying image project, and I need to be able to get the components for reusing in another project and do it in shorter time so that I don't have to reinvent the wheel. So uh, writing everything again from scratch. And uh, obviously we need a scalability. We are in the cloud, so everything is elastic. We have to make sure that everything is, um, is uh, able to scale uh, on demand. And auditability. So we must make sure of who did what. So governance is going to be very important. Um, so for that, we follow um, a few tenets uh, that we recommend normally. Um, so the first one is you want to create automated and reproducible ML workflow. So as I said before, everything must be as much automated as possible. The other thing is that you want to manage those models in a model registry. So normally we have services like in Amazon, uh, Elastic Container Registry is one example. So we work with containers heavily because that's a good way uh, to minimize that variance, to be consistent. Uh, and and um, registering those models in images is a good way of doing that. Uh, but you could also use other tools, like an example, Artifactory or things like that, right? Uh, we also want to enable CI/CD and infrastructure as code. So you have to follow the best practice of DevOps. Machine learning should be no different to that in that sense. So use your Jenkins or in AWS use code pipeline, code commit, and these kind of tools. Um, and obviously, once we push in production, we have to monitor everything, right? So we have to check performance metrics and feedback information to the models. That's very important because that will help us to improve the way that we have our models. Okay. So now we saw a few of the principles. Now let's talk about technology. We all love to talk about technology anyway. So um, the first thing is, if we see a machine learning cycle like this, and obviously this is extremely simplified uh, from the regular uh, amount of steps that we normally have in the, in the real cycle. Um, I would say that for the first part, which is dealing with the data collection, integration, preparation, cleaning, and all of that, uh, we have a broad range of services in the cloud. Uh, where no, no matter the vendor that you're using, but if you're using AWS, you probably uh, know Amazon S3 as the storage, Glue for doing ETL and, and working with Spark, and uh, EMR for using Hadoop clusters, Athena for using SQLs on, on your queries on the fly, on metadata, Redshift as a data warehouse or columnar that database for your information, and SageMaker. You can also do collection integration and preparation and cleaning with SageMaker. And I tell you what, um, in two weeks from now, we have the annual event in AWS for launching the new uh, services, the new feature that is called reInvent. This year is going to be special as uh, any event in the world this year. So it's for free and it's remote. It's going to be uh, three weeks until mid-December. I will leave you the link at the end of the session. And I recommend you to attend especially the sessions on the December the 1st, the keynote, and December the 8th, which is the keynote on machine learning. We have a ton of things about AI and ML that we are going to 
be releasing. And uh, SageMaker is going to play a very important role in many parts of the pipeline, being this one of them, okay? So stay tuned on that. But what about the rest of the pipeline? So, well, for the rest of the pipeline, we pretty much covered that with SageMaker already. So um, that's visualization analysis, the feature engineering, training, parameter tuning, evaluation, and hosting those models, doing uh, batch inference, uh, hyperparameter optimization, and these kind of things. Um, to be honest, most of the features that we are going to be releasing are going to be uh, even complementing this more. So um, again, stay tuned on the news that, that we are going to have on that. But uh, if you're familiar with the stack of services of AWS for machine learning in general, you probably know this slide. So we have uh, many options from less managed infrastructure at the bottom, where we pretty much give you an image for virtual machines or for a container that comes preloaded with the libraries and the frameworks like TensorFlow, AmexNet, PyTorch, uh, obviously with the APIs like Gluon, Scikit-Learn, uh, Horowood, Keras, etc. We have another layer, which is the platform where we have SageMaker. Uh, SageMaker being the end-to-end -end platform to help data scientists to be more efficient in the world for not reinventing the wheel. And um, the last stage uh, at the top is pretty much the AI services, which is a set of uh, fully managed services where you just consume those through an API. It's uh, intended to be very simple to use for a specific use cases, like an example, computer vision, forecasting, personalization, fraud, uh, search, chatbots, etc. And we have new members of this family coming very soon, as I said before. Um, so you have a broad range of options coming from compute by using pure Amazon EC2 uh, to the management of those, uh, even with containers, in example, by using Elastic Container Service or Elastic Kubernetes Service, whether you're using Docker or, or Kubernetes, uh, even Qflow integrations, if you are using Qflow today for orchestrating your pipelines. And then uh, the registry of those images that I said before in ECR and SageMaker as, as the platform for doing data science, for doing machine learning. And uh, let's assume that you are in your experiments, you are using SageMaker or any tool that you like for doing the experimentation and training of your models. You are happy with your model and you are ready um, uh, for pushing this model to production. So you probably have something like this. So you are working in your IDE. It can be SageMaker Studio, which is our own AD IDE, or you can be working locally or even with PyCharm or with Visual Studio Code. And then you are happy with your um, uh, process right now in experimentation. The data scientist says, I'm ready. I can push this to production, right? Um, what happens then is that what happens is that we have to orchestrate the lines that we had in this cycle. So we uh, managed to get it once. Now we have to orchestrate the whole thing so that we can integrate this in production. And for doing this, we have two options. Option one, we go with managed tools, right? So with third-party tools, like in example, Qflow that I mentioned before, Airflow, Jenkins. Uh, we rely on uh, repositories like Bitbucket. Uh, we even integrate with partners like MLflow, uh, obviously repositories like GitHub, etc. All of those are supported with integration with SageMaker today because SageMaker is very modular. So you can use pieces like, an example, training in somewhere and hosting in SageMaker or uh, the other way around. So training in SageMaker and hosting somewhere else, you can choose. Um, but that's with third party. And uh, with regards to Qflow, because it's very relevant these days, uh, there is many people trying Qflow. Uh, we normally uh, support in SageMaker two ways of connecting. One, when you're using plain Kubernetes to the SageMaker operators for Kubernetes, which is pretty much like a YAML templates that are preloaded for helping you uh, leveraging on SageMaker for some specific task in your machine learning workflow. And then we have the other option is, we, if you are using Qflow pipelines today, then we can integrate through the SageMaker components for, say, for Q, Qflow pipelines. So the experience is actually seamless when you are integrating your uh, pipelines in, from this single pane of glass of Qflow, and you are still leveraging on SageMaker and the infrastructure in the cloud, and all the power of the instances that we have there, and all the features about auto scaling, spot instances, et cetera, uh, in SageMaker in AWS. Um, okay, but what if you use uh, the native services of AWS for the orchestration? Well, in that case, today you have options like code pipeline, code commit, step functions, which is our workflow uh, generator and, and manager, Lambda, which is serverless functions, CloudFormation, which is infrastructure and co as code, and obviously SageMaker. 
And uh, I tell you what, we have many surprises on this with SageMaker very soon. So again, stay tuned because it's going to be very important for this area. Um, but normally, let's assume that you integrate those tools in the uh, workflow as we have it here. We, you normally will have a step machine with, with, work, uh, with step functions to define your workflow. And those can be triggered by events. In example, whenever I put new data in an S3 bucket in my storage, I want to trigger an automatic execution of a retraining of my models, in example. So I want to do pre-processing, training, evaluation, register a new model, and propose a model to be pushed to production, right? So that's going to be orchestrated by the workflow and then propose as a CI CD pipeline in code pipeline, in example. Um, step functions here plays an important role because it pretty much helps us build in this pipeline, right? So it, today it supports what we call the data science SDK, which is a way to integrate with SageMaker. And again, we are adding a management layer on all of that so that you can do everything from a single pane of glass. Um, okay, so how is the full picture now? Let's imagine that we go through the full architecture. Now you have three separate environments. That's also good to reduce the radius blast that you can have in case of any error, etc. So you have a development or a staging uh, area, you have an automation area, and then uh, finally you have a pre-production and production area. So in the development and staging is normally the place where the data scientists are going to be working uh, with your models. They are going to define those step machines, they are going to uh, uh, prepare everything on the experimentation, etc. And when they are happy, they will push to a staging and they will package all the artifacts and all the lineage of the model uh, to the registry and then uh, tell the DevOps guys, okay, I have this package ready to be pushed to production. And the automation account is going to be central to your team while the dev development and staging is probably split per project. And again, this is what we have seen in our customers, but every customer could be different. And uh, in the automation, they will say, okay, I'm now going to push a release pipeline where we basically are going to put an endpoint in production to, with our model preloaded so that we can respond to inference through an API. So that could be a typical case. Um, uh, obviously, you need to respond to requests from a client that you could have in a front end or outside in another system, et cetera. Um, the important thing here is that we can even monitor drift and we can even monitor some parameters on how good our model is doing in production or whether we have any problems in production through SageMaker model monitor. So that's one of the features that we have in SageMaker between the ton of things that, that we are supporting today in the platform. Um, this looks the same if we have a, a batch inference job. Let's say it's offline. We don't need an endpoint uh, all the time, 24-7 in production, but we can just run an inference in a file and then write the results. Um, so it's the same schema. The difference is that we run a batch inference job in our pre-production or production account uh, with our data set. Cool. So um, this is an example of a real use case. I hope you can see it fine in the slide uh, from a customer. So uh, this is how they split the teams. And that's very important because you want to split the responsibilities in your teams also. So as I said before, you have an automation account at the top where the DevOps and CICD engineers are the owners. So they will define, they will approve the pipelines, they will define how is the structure, uh, they will be handling the model registry, and they will collect insights and metrics and logs. And normally you have uh, operations engineers who are also um, approving things to production and consuming the metrics to check whether we have any incident uh, in, in production. While in the lower side, we have the development account or the staging account where the data scientists are going to be working mainly and they are going to do their experimentation and pushing things uh, to be deployed in production. And then the pre-production and production accounts for hosting the actual inferences that we are doing. At the bottom, you will see that we have what we call the data platform. So depending on how mature your company is already, you might have a data lake. So a modern data lake uh, based on the cloud uh, with Amazon S3, an example, or any other provider. Um, if that's not the case, you probably have something more traditional here, like a database, a traditional database, or even a separate, um, let's say, a storage containers for, for each one of the areas of your company or things like this, okay? Another example from another company was uh, when they were doing a, a retail demand forecasting. So uh, they were uh, 
building this concept that we see very often, which is what they call the automation ML factory. ML factory um, algorithm lake is another way that they call it, where is that every data scientist, every artifact that they write, so every piece of Python script, every piece of model, every algorithm, um, they will store in a, sp a specific bucket in S3, and they will call that the ML lake or the or the algorithm lake. And what they do is that they define some templates in JSON, in YAML, etc., where they basically define the pipeline that they want to follow. So, an example, I want to use this pre-processing script that I know that I have here from a previous project. I want to connect with this regression algorithm. I want to connect with this classification algorithm, etc. So, um, that's something that is called the ML factory, and it's the way that we are scaling. So, you don't have to reinvent uh, or rewrite all those artifacts again. What do you get with this? Well, you get efficiency. So normally in this customer, this is a case from Europe, as I said before, it's a, it's a retail customer doing demand forecast for more than 600,000 um, models uh, in parallel. And they reduce the whole process from 14 hours to less than one and a half hours. And the cost of doing that was less than $800 for the company while they were spending uh, $20,000 uh, per month. On this, they were only spending uh, less than $800 per month on the full thing. So uh, there are even services that doesn't appear like Lambda. Lambda is pretty much uh, for free because you pay per million executions on this. And they were hosting the ML models in Lambdas actually here. So um, that was very efficient. Um, so the final thing before we wrap up is that we need to balance the needs of the ML builders, of the data scientists who wants to be agile, right? So they want to be flexible and they want to move very fast, innovate, uh, create new things. So let's, let's take the last thing that, that we have heard. Um, let's take uh, any new algorithm like GANs, reinforcement learning, etc. But on the other side, you have the people from cloud IT that has to establish governance, right? So they want to control costs. They want to make sure that we comply with the regulations. They want to make sure that nobody messed up with the security. Um, so obviously, we have to find a compromise between the two of them. And uh, it's easy to do that today in the cloud. So with AWS, you could have a multi-account structure with something like Control Tower. And there, you can use uh, services like Service Catalog, in example, to predefine some templates where you can give self-service access to the data scientists and the DevOps teams to do this kind of project. So whenever I'm a data scientist and I want to start a new project, I want to do my forecasting project or, or, or whatever, I just click on my self-service console in service catalog and I deploy an environment that is already pre-approved by my governance people uh, and has permissions to buy staging and development environments and does not have permission to push anything to production, right? So I'm safe on that. The data that I can access to is also controlled, etc. Um, so um, for the other people, the DevOps teams and the, and the system uh, teams, you give them a permission to the actual production um, environments and the metrics, logs, etc. But you don't give them permissions to mess up with the models and the algorithms and the data scientists work. So that's kind of how we do it at scale um, in the companies today with AWS. So key takeaways from this session. First of all, do not reinvent the wheel, be efficient. So you have to ask yourself, is my company doing engineering? Are we building platforms? Are we building software? Or are we building use cases? Are we building solutions? So that's going to be very important because researching Qflow, researching Metaflow, which is the other one uh, from Netflix, uh, researching these kind of um, areas that are very green, that are still not mature, will take you a lot of time. And uh, you have to ask yourself whether you have the time to spend on that. Otherwise, just rely on the tools that we have already. So uh, in AWS, we have many, but you also have from third parties. So um, do not reinvent the wheel. Again, be efficient. The other thing is avoid the anti-patterns that we mentioned before. Be agile on those. And obviously follow the best practice principles in your ML designs, at least the ones that we know until now, right? Consistency, flexibility, reproducibility, reusability, scalability, and auditability. Final slide before we go for questions. I leave you some resources here. You can take a screenshot if you want of the URLs, but uh, you can also scan uh, the QR code that, that I leave in there. That's pretty much for registering to the RainBand. RainBand is running from November 30 to the 18th of December. I cannot tell you specifically, I'm not authorized to tell you the good things that we are going to have, but I guarantee that it's going to be a ton of good stuff coming from machine learning and artificial intelligence. So do not miss uh, RainBand.
that's uh, my piece of advice. You also have our training and certification portal, sample notebooks, our machine learning blog, our documentation, and obviously the web architectic framework white papers. There is one specific for machine learning if you want to check. So with that, I think we are on time. And uh, you have my Twitter handle there if you want to connect or if you want more information or if you want those slides that I showed before or having a meeting, feel free to contact me and uh, I will be happy to attend. Antonio. That's great. You've been so punctual. Thank you so much. So that was a, a very thorough um, talk. You outlined all the do's and don'ts, and I found the use cases to be very illustrative. We saw the benefits, the before, the after, so that was very helpful. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and also, I believe you mentioned there were some keynotes coming up on, the, on December the 1st and the 8th. Do you want That's to correct. just remind us where we go to see those? Yeah, so you can go to, uh, as I said before, you can register at reinvent.awsevents.com. And uh, there is a, the keynote from Andy Jassy, our CEO, is on December the 1st. So uh, that's where we release the most important things, obviously. And the other one is going to be on December the 8th, which is from Swami, who is our VP for machine learning. It's going to be focused exclusively on machine learning, and it's going to be also very fun to watch. Okay. You showed that uh, very impressive graph in the early part of your talk where we saw the number of machine learning tools, how they're growing exponentially. That can't carry on forever, presumably. How do you see this landscape developing in the near future? So I think it, it is going to consolidate eventually, right? But uh, right now uh, it is a wild world. So uh, it is complex to uh, get order on things. And we see this in customers every day. So. Uh, again, my recommendation is to not reinvent the wheel. You have the options there already, and um, try to keep it simple. So if you go with, with, with any cloud vendor, and I'm not saying this because I'm, I'm from AWS, but with any cloud vendor, you have the options already for doing the end-to-end -end, um, uh, with managed services. So that will lower your TCO, and that will definitely make the time to market shorter for you. Great. Here's a more specific question for you. Um, according to you, what are the main challenges to apply MLOPS in edge computing scenarios? So, yeah, edge computing is a scenario that is very common these days. So, obviously, we are trying, we are making an effort to push the services from the cloud to the edge, but uh, there is a, uh, a specific use cases where this makes sense or other use cases where this doesn't. So, the main uh, concern that you will have there is compute power. So, in the edge devices, normally you have very few compute power, and uh, running inferences on some specific use cases is going to be a real challenge. So. Uh, again, we have news on that as well um, for helping and that, and that's also an uh, area that is accelerating a lot in terms of machine learning. Okay. Antonio, I think that's pretty much uh, all we have time for right now. You've given us your contact details. You've told us where we can get your slides. So that's fantastic and really enjoyed that talk. Thank you so much and uh, hope Thank to see you, you again soon. Me.